Hello, everyone. I'm Professor Paul Carrier of the Western Michigan University Thomas M. Cooley Law School, and what I'd like to do now is provide some information with regard to Class 13 of our Contracts 1 course. And what I, what I will do is I will provide uh, some of the basics that you need to know, as well as uh, the basic ideas that you need to pull out of the cases. I don't want to do the briefing for you. Uh, however, statute of frauds is incredibly important, particularly for bar exam purposes. It's one of the more highly testable subjects. And furthermore, we are in week 13, and uh, I understand that everyone would be starting to uh, switch to an exam study mode. And so uh, in the spirit of helping you with exams, I will try to provide some of the backdrop that will be helpful as you, as you work through the materials. The Statute of Frauds was promulgated originally in 1677 in England, and it was to prevent the problem of oral contracts and the uh, recognition of oral contracts, a uh, reason being that each party would prefer probably to, uh, shall we say, skew the facts in his, her, or its favor rather than necessarily tell the truth. And so to prevent fraud and perjury, uh, the courts began to develop uh, rules with regard to certain contracts needing to be in writing, otherwise they were not provable. Understand, it doesn't say... It doesn't uh, work as if there is no contract. It's more of the, in fact, it's an affirmative defense. There's no writing of the contract, and so we cannot prove it. And that distinction becomes very important when it comes to trying to enforce oral contracts. And I'll try to explain that. I will in class. I will try to as well in this video. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, six or seven main categories of contracts that need to be in writing, Otherwise, the other party uh, has a defense that there's no agreement, we can't prove it, it's not substantiated enough for us to prove it and have a contract because it's not in writing. The first one is marriage. Ma uh, uh, contracts made in contemplation of marriage typically had to be in writing, and it usually wasn't between husband and wife. It was between family members and a husband and or a wife. For example, dower. If you marry my daughter, I will give you 80 acres of my land. If that was not in writing, then often it was not enforceable because uh, you can imagine the nature of trying to litigate that if it's oral. And, oh, I only promised 20. Oh, I, you promised a million. Uh, you can imagine the problem. So those things had to be in writing uh, because the, the, the potential for fraud and problems uh, was just too great. Second, contracts that uh, cannot take place within one year had to be in writing. So if you could do a service in three months, in six months, didn't have to be in writing. You could still try to prove it uh, in front of a fact finder. But contracts over a year, that was uh, determined to be a long enough period to require a writing because of the length and seriousness. But you, can you imagine the length of performance? That's a long time to block somebody in with a contract. And so the courts developed a requirement that it needed to be in writing. There are some exceptions to that that I'll go into a little bit later, even in this presentation, but also in class. L or land, contracts for the sale of land have to be in writing. Contracts for a significant interest in land, like a life estate, like a contingent or a uh, vested remainder, those had to be in writing. Easements often had to be in writing, typically had to be in writing. There are some exceptions to that. Certain interests might not have to be in writing so long as the parties uh, show activity in regard to that, but I don't want you to get hung up on that. Understand that most of these things have to be in writing. There are some exceptions. Let's just leave it at that for now. Also, leases. Short leases, not in writing in most jurisdictions, but leases that exceed or, are, or exceed one year, I think it's exceed one year, have to be in writing as well uh, because you can see how long land can be tied up and we really want to see a, a contract for that because otherwise when people lie, oh, you promised that cheap rent forever, for a million years, you can imagine the amount of perjury that would go on in such a situation. And the writing helps to prove what the parties intended, and we can't believe necessarily either side without that written proof. Uh, executors. Uh, the situation is where, let's say that um, somebody dies in my family, and I'm the executor. So I'm responsible to divvy up, th with legal permission, with court approval, the estate. And you deserve 10% of 100000 That's the estate now. 
what if I promised you 10000 now? Let me give it to you now. You need to pay your tuition. And then I would just keep the 10000 that would have been yours when the estate closes. Okay, That had to be in writing. Because you can imagine how people would lie about that. He promised me he'd pay me now, and I don't have to wait three years until the estate finally closes, as an example. Uh, and those situations were fraught with perjury fraud, lack of memory, uh, artful interpretation of, of, the, of what was actually said. That's putting it mildly and somewhat politely. You can imagine why that should be in writing. Uh, goods, the G, sale of goods, $500 or more for sale of goods. Contract is supposed to be in writing. There's an exception to that I'll talk about a little bit later in this presentation that you need to be aware of, very aware of. But uh, I will, or there, in fact, there are three exceptions, but I'll get to that in a little bit. And I will also cover it in class in significant detail. Uh, surety ship. If some third party promises a debt, that needs to be in writing. Otherwise, it simply cannot be believed. You tell Western Michigan University, Thomas M. Cooley Law School, that I promise to pay your tuition this term. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I would suggest that if you want to actually assert that properly, you had better have that one in writing because no one is going to believe it. You can see the danger there, though. Dad promised to pay for the car if I couldn't. Uh, my neighbor promised to pay that the taxes if I couldn't. Uh, you can imagine the amount of perjury, of lying, of fraud, of artful remembrance of what the facts really were in such situations and you can see why uh, it, it really needs to be in writing or it should be in writing with some exceptions mind you but you can imagine the problem the executor provision and the surety provision are relatively similar you see how both of them are promises from a third party for some activity those you can treat as similar uh, add to that and by the way that the uh, the uh, what would you call that the acronym for that is my legs. Marriage, year, land, executors, goods, surety ship. My legs. Add to that, please, dot com. And this relates to the sale of goods, the G now. Um, if a contract is under $500, it does not have to be in writing. That's what the rules say, including UCC Article 2-201. If, however, a modification comes along. A modification under UCC Article 2-209 does not need consideration, separate consideration, to be binding if it makes sense within the parameters of the overall bargain, if it's a natural flow from what's going on between the parties. If, however, you have a small contract and a modification of that contract takes it to $500 or more, now you need a writing which would certainly be of the modification, but that modification would, of course, then uh, reference or incorporate by reference the underlying contract because now you've reached the $500 or more trigger for uh, the statute of frauds uh, writing requirement. Now, I'd like to go over a few uh, particular factual scenarios. One exception to statute of frauds. You have a situation where there is not a writing. And you find this in one of your first cases, Philo, the subcontracting case. If somebody makes a promise orally to pay something, but that promise really is to help them, then it's outside of the statute of frauds, or it can be treated as an exception. Example, you're the subcontractor who's afraid to work further because I'm not paying you. I need you to finish. I need you to finish, or I don't get paid. So I beg you, please finish, and I promise I'll pay you, which allows me to go to my principal and collect my money as contractor. You see how the, that deal between you and me has a specific benefit to me so that I get paid? That can fall outside of the statute of frauds, okay, as an exception. Uh, another non-exception, but something important. When you have more than one writing, you have an email, you have a letter, you have a stick -em note that's got some writing on it, you can cobble together the agreement from different pieces of paper, okay? And that's critical because somebody can say, oh, where's the contract with my name on it? It's three pages and has a merger clause, blah, 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 blah. That's not the requirement. It needs to be a memorialization, not necessarily a contract. If it has sufficient information, no matter what its 
on or where it's located, so long as it's provable, right? And you have, of course, with evidence, uh, you have to uh, uh, establish its, its, its provenance. This is, in fact, the email that I wrote to him, you know, and I wrote in my name, et cetera, et cetera. You could cobble those things together uh, as long as it has things like the parties, the object of the contract, some uh, suggestion of pricing or a mechanism for pricing, and some aspect of quantity. Quantity is often one of the big problems with regard to statute of frauds because that is one of the most important things needed. And in fact, the UCC uh, doesn't, uh, uh, in fact, as a moratorium on enforcing contracts where the quantity is not stated. The rule is UCC does not allow enforcement of a contract above the amount of quantity stated. Okay? So you have a case where there are several writings and emails going back and forth, including electronic signatures, which turned out to be fine. And by cobbling all of those things together, we had more than enough information to have that memorial of what the agreement was. And, that, uh, and therefore, it, is sta it satisfied the statute of frauds requirements. A few further factual scenarios that are quite important uh, with regard to contracts in excess of one year. The rule is there's a presumption that if it's not clear, things can be performed within one year. So you're building my house. Presumption is less than a year. It doesn't have to be in writing. And to avoid that, you have to put in the time. It'll take at least 16 months. Okay, so keep that one in mind. Remember, courts, this is a rule that is a defense rather than a baseline rule. And so courts actually don't really jump too quickly to honor the statute of frauds. In fact, the other way around. Because it's an affirmative defense not an element of a contractual relationship. And that's an important distinction if you can get your mind around it. Uh, back to UCC, the uh, 2-306 output and requirements contracts. If there's an outputs contract or a requirements contract, as covered in a, a few uh, course uh, classes ago, those would, of course, suffice to establish the quantity for purposes of, of a writing and the quantity term of a writing because those are subject to performance to either the order of goods or to the uh, supply of goods at, by the party who would be acting in good faith. We can come up with a, with a reasonable number, uh, provable in court if necessary. Uh, again, the, there's another case that deals with uh, emails going back and forth. Uh, I think that was the, the land sale case. Uh, this memo or a group of writings that memorialize a contract do not have to take the form of agreement, parties, terms, signatures. It can be something else or several things that are cobbled together. Um, there is the requirement of signing by the party being charged. The party that's being sued and are, uh, we're, uh, we're, the argument is being used against that person that there is an agreement that has to be honored. That person has to have signed the document uh, or, or documents uh, keeping in mind email signatures work. Let's talk quickly about exceptions. Some of them we covered in some of those factual scenarios just covered. But let me go over them again. First, you can go in equity with restitution. That's an exception. We have no contract, statute of frauds, but he's still painted three quarters of the garage. He deserves in equity the value of that service in quantum merit. That is one way to get around the statute of frauds. Another is part performance. If a party has done significant performance, uh, then the evidence that they, the, uh, an agreement was in place is there. Why would you go paint three quarters of a garage if there wasn't an agreement in place? So you can get around it by arguing uh, that part performance creates the, the facts so we can imply, in fact, a contract. Uh, by the way, if you look at 2-201 sub 3a, you'll find similarities between that and part performance. Admissions. If a party admits in its pleadings or in other official areas that there was an agreement but it's not in writing, then the person is stuck. Okay, and you can see that in UCC 2-201 sub 3b. Confirmation. We talked about cobbling together different emails and whatnot for a contract. Well, that's the merchant's memo of UCC 2-201 sub 2. Don't forget the primary purpose or leading object exception we talked about very early on. And also keep in mind that there are certain arguments of waiver and estoppel that can also work, and I'll discuss that more in class to get around statute of frauds. Thank you.